Before we deploy our neural network, I'd like to talk about how you can change some of the hyperparameters in Edge Impulse to tweak the model. We've been using the defaults for everything because they work well for these particular demos. However, you'll likely come across situations where the model doesn't quite meet your needs. Maybe you're working with an unusual audio frequency and the default model doesn't give you great accuracy. This is where playing with the hyperparameters can help. Depending on the type of model chosen in Edge Impulse, these settings might look a little different. But let's look at the audio classification example. We've already talked about the training cycles. This controls the number of epics and each pass through the entire training set is known as an epic. Generally, more epics is better as it gives the model more time to fit to the data. When working with complex neural networks, it may take some time for the loss to start to drop, as the parameters have not started to generalize the trends in the data yet after just a few epics. And a few epics might mean thousands of epics when you're working with very complex models like the ones used for object detection in images. If, after you've let your model fully train, you see that the loss has not really converged, it likely means you need to let it train for longer. This can be accomplished by increasing the number of training epics. Ideally, you want to see your loss do something like this. It decreases as the model fits to the training data and then levels off for a good number of epics. How many epics this is can be up to you and is often dependent on the total number of training cycles. If we're training with 100 epics, I personally like to see at least 10 or 20 of those epics have the loss value be at or around the same value before I consider training to be done for that model. Note that training done does not necessarily mean I have a good model. It just means I've trained that model as far as it can go. There's one catch here that you should be aware of and that's the local minimum. Let's say you train a model and your loss over time looks something like this. It's converged to a loss value for over half the training time so you consider it to be done. However, it doesn't look like it's a great model as it appears to be underfit to the data. The loss is too high for your liking and the accuracy is terrible. Machine learning is all about minimizing the loss or cost function of a particular model. When you're working with many dimensions and complex models, it's nearly impossible to determine what the absolute minimum loss will be. So most models start training with randomized parameters and begin iteratively adjusting them trying to find something that produces a smaller loss. As a result, you may sometimes end up in a local minimum where you ideally want to be in the global minimum for the loss function. The model can sometimes get stuck here and it's worth just training again with new randomized parameters to see if that fixes things. And sometimes you may have to let it train for longer to see if it eventually gets out of that local minimum. If training for longer doesn't seem to correct the issue, your model just might be underfit to the data and you either need to get more data or adjust the model. If the loss does seem to converge on the global global minimum or something close enough, you can often call it good enough and stop the training. By letting training run longer, you're just wasting time at that point. If the loss from your training set looks amazing, like you have zero loss, be wary. You might have found perfect separation in your features where you can train a perfect model. However, this might also indicate other issues at work. For example, you might have created a naive classifier, so you'll want to check your confusion matrix. Additionally, your model might have overfit your data. The way to check this is to compare your training loss to your validation or test set loss. If your training set loss looks great in comparison to your validation loss, you likely have an overfit model. Sometimes you'll see the validation loss follow the training loss and then start to get worse. If you've tried other methods to prevent overfitting, like getting better data or adding regularization terms, then you can employ early stopping to get the best model from this training. You'd want to pick the model that resulted when the validation loss was at its lowest. Edge Impulse does this automatically for us so we don't need to do it manually. For many embedded applications, 100 training cycles is a good place to start for simpler models. Feel free to adjust this if you think you need more or less epics during training. The learning rate reflects how much the network's parameters can change at each step in the training process. If your learning rate is too low, it means the model can't update its parameters fast enough to start fitting to trends. As a result, it would take a long time for your loss to converge and your model to fit to the data. It might get there, but you're probably wasting precious time to make it happen. You may also find that overfitting can happen if the learning rate is too low. If you have a good learning rate, your loss will drop and then converge to some value in a reasonable amount of time. If your learning rate is too high, parameters may be updated but overshoot 
their intended targets. This will likely result in a noisy loss graph that begins to diverge or rise in value. If you see this, you should try reducing the learning rate. Processes like learning rate momentum or annealing allow you to combine the best of both worlds. You can start with a high learning rate that decreases over time as you approach the best loss minimum. This will allow for faster training while avoiding the divergent loss. For now, we'll stick with a static learning rate of 0.005 for this demo. The minimum confidence rating is just used for validation and testing in Edge Impulse. Any labels that show up with a confidence rating under this threshold aren't counted. It helps us validate that the model is sure of its predictions when it makes them. Data augmentation is available in some models on Edge Impulse. It adds computer-generated noise to our sound samples, similar to how we added background noise. You can add random noise or randomly mask out sections of time or different frequencies. You can also stretch random segments of time. These options will ideally help overfitting and create a more robust model. Since we were able to add our own custom background noise, I'll leave this off for now, but feel free to play around with it to see if you can create a better model. The model architecture is where the real fun begins for machine learning practitioners, but it can be daunting as there are infinite possibilities of what you can create. Your best bet is to start with an architecture that someone else has already designed and modify it from there. There's a little bit of art and black magic that goes into finding a good architecture for your particular project unless you really understand the math that's going on in each layer. A lot of machine learning is tweaking the architecture or other hyperparameters retraining, and seeing if it makes the model more accurate. You're welcome to see if the two-dimensional convolutional neural network performs better than the one-dimensional version. We've gone through all of these layers, so you should have a decent idea of what this network is doing. Let's say you want to modify this architecture or create your own. The best place to start is by searching for your particular application with machine learning or neural network. Start reading some academic papers or websites that talk about how they've solved similar problems. Hopefully you'll come across an example of a model architecture that would work as a good starting point. For example, here's one that's written in Keras. They use a two-dimensional CNN with three convolution layers and no dropout. The first convolution layer has 25 filters and a 5x5 kernel with a rectified linear unit activation. A max pooling layer with a 2x2 window directly follows that. The next convolution layer has 50 filters and a 5x5 kernel with another max pooling layer. The batch normalization layer tries to keep the output mean close to zero with a standard deviation close to one. It might help, but I don't think we have the option to add it into Edge Impulse right now. The third convolution layer has 70 filters with a 3x3 kernel followed by another set of max pooling and normalization layers. Finally, the output of this convolution stage is flattened to a single dimension and sent to the classifier. The classifier is three layers of dense or fully connected basic neural network nodes. The first two layers have 100 nodes with the rectified linear unit activation function. The final layer has 10 nodes corresponding to the 10 classes, and the output is sent to the softmax function which we've seen before. This is a much more complicated image classifier than what we're using, but it might be a decent starting point if you're trying to classify real images instead of MEL frequency separate coefficients. Because Edge Impulse knows we're working with audio data, it gives us a default convolutional neural network that's known to work with speech input. However, you're welcome to modify it for your own needs. For example, we can click on a convolution layer and edit the number of filters and kernel size. You can also add more convolution layers before the max pooling layer. You can adjust the dropout rate. This is a number worth playing with to see if it helps reduce overfitting. You can move the layers around too if you wish. Finally, you can add another layer. Let's say you wanted to add another dense layer, so we click Add next to Dense. The number of nodes you start with is often fairly arbitrary. Without a lot of research into what your neural network is doing exactly, it's a bit of a guessing game. I find that something more than your final number of nodes is a good starting point. So let's try 8, which is more than 4. This makes the classifier more complex, so it will require more computing power on your microcontroller. It also might mean it's more prone to overfitting. A network with more nodes and less layers is known as a wide but shallow network. In general, these are good at memorizing and picking out details but are also prone to overfitting. More layers is known as a deep neural network. They can be great at picking out intermediate features in the data and generalizing to the data. However, they become more computationally expensive and can still overfit. 
The idea is you want to make a model as small as possible to get the job done without overfitting. This is where playing with the size and shape of the architecture will pay off. For now, let's stick with the default neural network so that we know things will work on deployment. However, feel free to play around with some of the hyperparameters in your own project to see if you can increase the accuracy without overfitting and without needing too many extra processing resources. Note that you can click on the three dots in the upper right corner and go to the Keras view. If you're familiar with Keras, you can modify the architecture manually using code. Let's switch back to the default visual mode and train again to make sure everything goes back to the way it was. Feel free to check the validation and test results again to make sure you're happy with the way the model performs before moving on to the deployment step.